<laughs> okay, so, uh, well, uh, Mr. McRae, we appreciate you letting us interview you today. And why don't you start by just talking about, uh, I know you were born in February of 1943. Why don't you start talking about your earliest memories of uh, life in uh, Ackworth and, and uh, the surrounding areas? Well, my memory of Ackworth as a, as a young person was basically in my neighborhood. That was, you know, until I got to be a teenager type thing. Uh, a lot of local... Fr- I grew up in a neighborhood that had a lot of kids my age, mm-hmm. so we did a lot of things together. Uh, and where was the neighborhood? The neighborhood was off of Maple Drive. My okay. father owned three houses down there, and we went from one to the other to the other type thing. Mm-hmm. As we got, as I got bigger, they uh, moved into more roomy houses. I guess mm-hmm. would be a better way of putting it. But. Uh, a lot of the stuff that the other folks remember of paving streets and doing this, that, and other, those dates no, don't ring bells to me, but a lot of the stuff that happened in Ackworth mm-hmm. that I found funny or mm-hmm. different at the time, I remember. So uh, what did you kids do when you were growing up? We built ramps for our bicycles. We, at that time, we could ride all over town and not worry about anything. Our parents didn't worry about us. Mm-hmm. And if we did something on the other side of town and we got our behinds tore up, which we got back home that night, the parents would know about it, and we'd get it the second time. So the whole town was babysitters. Mm-hmm. Uh, all the merchants on town, they knew us by name. Mm-hmm. Uh, just a lot of fun for a group of young people. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we got to be mid-teenagers, we there were several of us that ended up with mopeds and motor scooters, and we could drive all over town without a problem type thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have a moped? I had a Cushman Eagle motor scooter. I was okay. really proud of it. It made lots and lots of noise. And uh, Miss Nancy Maxwell's husband told me one time that once I got married and had a kid, don't matter if I moved to California, he was going to find me and wake that kid up every evening with some sort of loud motor like I did <laughs> when I went by their house on that motor scooter. Uh-huh. <laughs> so, yeah, everybody... Everybody knew everybody back then, and it was a lot of fun. Well, now, the beach uh, would have opened up about the time that uh, you were in elementary school, I guess. It was, and that was a lot of fun. I can remember when cars were parked from the beach all the way up to the grammar school Mm -hmm. on both sides of the road, on all the roads. Uh, It was the place to be in Cobb County. Uh, If you wanted to find a young lady... That was a good place to do it. The mm-hmm. big, biggest put down I ever got was down there. A young lady and I had been talking, and I thought things were going really good. And after a while, I asked her, I said, can I call you sometime? And she says, sure. I says, uh, I need your number. She said, it's in the book. Mm-hmm. I said, well, what's your name? She said, it's in there, too, and turned around and walked off. <laughs> I, never, <laughs> I never forgot that. <laughs> Okay. Uh, talk about uh, going to school in, in Ackworth. Well, we went to school, and at that time they were having not enough room and too many pupils type thing. Mm-hmm. So they did some half days. Some of us went from 8 in the morning until 12, and some went from 12 to 4. Because uh, mm-hmm. the area was growing? So it, I you know, I was young. I didn't know what the reason was. I just knew that that's the way it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a lot of classes in the old Army barracks hut type thing where now they have outside trailers. Mm-hmm. We did it in a—we always called them the huts. If you had— huts? Yeah, if you had uh, misbehaved at all, you had to bring coal in for the pot-bellied stove. Mm-hmm. And— the teachers thought they were punishing us, us by doing that, but it turned out it was more fun doing that than it was sitting in class. So, <laughs> but yeah, it was. I uh, had some teachers that I really remember well that uh, worked with us and mm-hmm. put up with a lot of stuff they didn't have to. Talk about some of them. Uh, one of the main ones was a lady by the name of Mamie Pittner. Uh, Apparently in the third grade, and, and this will tell you how different things are from now and, and then. It was not unusual every day for her to release me and let me go to town 
pick up her mail at the post office. Mm -hmm. We lived right up here off Main Street. I'd stop by the house, get me mm -hmm. a drink of water mm -hmm. or milk or whatever, and then mm -hmm. walk back to school. Mm -hmm. That was just a, an everyday occurrence. It wasn't a big deal to anybody. Now then, folks would go to jail if they let you do that. <laughs> no. There was a, another teacher by the name of DeWitt Pridmore that uh, I remember him. He was he was very stern, but he had a sense of humor. He made everything fun, but he didn't put up with a whole lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're probably about uh, the age to have opened up North Cobb High School, weren't you? I was the third year to graduate. Uh, whenever we left Ackworth and went down there, I was a sophomore. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was one of those deals where I uh, met a lot of folks from Kennesaw. I was... I've always liked practical jokes. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of them pulled on me, but I pull a lot of them. So it's not a. As my daddy told me one time, if I get, if you're gonna put it out, you better be willing to take it. Mm -hmm. So I uh, met a lot of folks from Kennesaw, made lifelong friends. Some of them, uh, you and I just talked about a minute ago, that was in the hospital right now. Met him there and became real close friends with him. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the things that went on my senior year, I ended up having to sit in the principal's office every day at lunchtime when everybody else would go eat. Quick as I got through eating, I had to go to the principal's office the last six weeks of school as a, a misunderstanding about a pair of pantaloons being flown on the flagpole. And I'm sure somebody just misunderstood that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But you had something to do with it. Uh, I, I happen to know the folks had done it. Oh, right. <laughs> That's a better way of putting it. Did you play uh, any sports, football? Or no, sir. I was so uncoordinated I could not walk and chew chewing gum at the same time. Is that right? In fact, Vince, I went out for football, and Coach Matthews told me one day I got down in the stance, and he come over there and hollered and screamed at me. He said, Moose will crazy. Said, you couldn't hem a hog in a ditch. Put your knees back together and try to try to get some sort of stance. But no, I was never coordinated well enough to play sports. Mm. I tried. Yeah. yeah, it looks like you'd been good at football or basketball. Or well, the best thing I could do is lay down in front of them and make them have to go around. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, uh, Talk a little bit about uh, both of your parents. Your, your father, um, you know, I interviewed him back in 2000. Yeah. And, uh, and he told me a bunch of things that he'd done in his lifetime. But uh, uh, he worked for the city of Ackworth and for Cobb County and had his own business and what have you. And, uh, and you know, he talked about you going to work with him as a, as a baby. My, my father had a, a thing I was not happy about it at the time, but I'm now very appreciative of it. During the summer, the first week after school was out, I could do whatever I wanted to. After that, the second week, I started paying room and board. I paid room and board through the whole summer until the last week before school started back, and I didn't have to pay any then or while I was in school. Mm -hmm. His thoughts were, you're not going to sit around and do nothing. You're going to work somewhere. It can be with me. It can be with other people. I've, mm -hmm. I've worked at part-time jobs with all the merchants in town doing different things. He was, a, for a man with a third-grade education, he did well. He uh, became a, well, to start with, he worked at the tapestry mill. He worked at the cotton mill. He started his own plumbing business uh, back in and one of the things on the plumbing business that uh, people can probably appreciate, there's a nice stone house on the upper end of town. Some folks by the name of Cantrell live there. Mm -hmm. He got a call to go up there and replace a seat on a, a toilet. Back then, everything came with metal and they'd rust and you couldn't get them off like the plastic ones nowadays. Mm -hmm. He said it took him right at 30 minutes to get the old one off and put the new one on. And he walked outside, and Mr. Cantrell was sitting in the swing, swinging, and said he asked him, said, Olin, says, what I owe you? And I think it was a dollar and a half an hour he got then, and says, well, you know, I get a dollar and a half an hour with a minimum of an hour. Said the old man reached, got his pocket watch, pulled it out, and says, well, Olin, you hadn't been here but 30 minutes. 
and said, I get real lonesome. Said, why don't you sit down here with me? And said, when your hour's up, said, I'll pay you. And said, they sat there for 30 minutes swinging and talking. And after a while, the man said, well, your hour's up. He paid him and let him leave. <laughs> so <laughs> there was a, a lot of people around Ackworth that everybody just knew everybody and did well. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, he uh, worked at all the different places. He was a JP for the county. He was the inspector for the city. Uh, if there was a way to make money, he tried to find it. Mm -hmm. uh, at one time, he was, during Mary McCall's administration, he was a tax assessor for Ackworth. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. She even, and I can't find documentation on this, but she even paid him what, what we call Mitchell Hill is where the power station was. Paid him, I think it was 50 cents an hour, to go down and shoot squirrels that kept getting into the power station and shortening it out, he sat out there and shot squirrels and got paid for it. Mm. So, uh, you know, if there's a way to make a dollar, he tried to find it. Yeah. Well, it sounds like your mother was involved in all kinds of good works in the community. Why don't you talk she, about her? She was uh, basically his biggest supporter. You wouldn't know it some of the times, but uh, she always... The two of them love kids. That's why they, the place they had over there, they had it declared a petting zoo. Mm -hmm. Kids from grammar school would go over there on field trips and see the sheep and the donkeys and the peacocks and the guineas and that kind of thing. And she was a big part of that. Every holiday that they had, she would, in their pasture, uh, Valentine, she would hang Valentines all over the trees and that kind of thing. Same thing with Easter, there'd be eggs hanging at Christmas, because he had sheep, donkeys, and all, they put a live nativity scene up, and people would come from miles around to look at it. It was lit up with the real animals out there. Mm -hmm. So they love kids. Mm -hmm. you know? And what was it, the 30 acres, something like that? Well, actually, there again, with a man with a third grade education was a lot smarter than me. He bought a house that didn't have but uh, two acres with it. Uh -huh. That was the one they restored that was pre-Civil War. But it had government property on two sides of it, uh -huh. and he leased the government land for a dollar an acre a year. Oh. So for $20, he had an additional 20 acres every year, and that was his pastures and that uh -huh. kind of thing. And that becomes the petting zoo? That, that was all the petting zoo and uh -huh. all. He owned the property across the street from where they lived, where the new uh Community center is. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh, a lady by the name of Kate Good, one of the backwards teachers and book writers and that kind of thing, lived there. He bought the house and all the property on that side of the road. And uh, that was more of his pasture type thing where he kept the animals. So the, the city bought the property from your, yes. your father? From actually from me. From you? Yeah. And you still ho ho uh, still own the Antebellum House? Yes. Is that where you live? No, sir. My folks built that with a, it's an eight-room house, and uh, they built it with the intention of me and my brother and sister living there. Mm -hmm. My sister went off to college. I went off to college. My brother went into service. So mm -hmm. the two of them ended up in an eight-room house a year after they restored it. So mm -hmm. <laughs> it was kind of a waste, but... Uh, Is they, anybody living there now? No, right now it's not. We're in the process of trying to get it ready. I will be selling it no. one of these days. Mm -hmm. okay. You don't want to live there yourself? A single man doesn't need an eight-room house <laughs> with 12-foot ceilings. Well, probably not. <laughs> probably not. Uh, be a little bit uh, steep on the yeah. heating bill. Yeah, a little overkill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, uh did you work at, uh, did they have you work with the petting zoo, with the animals? No, I was was out of there by the time all that got, uh, I'd gone on and got my own place yeah. and a, a wife and that kind of thing. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, he made sure, and one of the things on it that with him, I said a while ago about having to work during the summer. Uh -huh. I got real independent one time, and uh, uh -huh. I went to him and, told him and I thought I was worth more than he was paying me. He was paying me a dollar an hour at that time. His best electrician was making $3 an hour. Uh -huh. And I told him I thought I ought to get a raise. I was worth more than that. He said, well, you probably are. I said, how much you want? So I was real brave. I said, how about a quarter an hour? He said, I don't have a problem with that. And I said, well, great. So that week I got $10 more because of that quarter raise, and I was happy capper. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> I went back, and when I went to give him the ten dollars I'd normally been paying for room and board, he said room and board went up. I said, "Do what?" He said, "Room and board is now twenty dollars." And I threw a fit. He said, "This is a life lesson. Always remember when you think you're getting ahead, there'll be something come along and take it away from you." Mm. I've remembered that, and it still works. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Uh, Andrews College in Cuthbert, Georgia. How did you get down there? Because I was not smart enough to get in anywhere else, and they'd give you a second chance. It was a sister school to Reinhardt, a Methodist college. Uh And they had a program where if you went down there for eight weeks during the summer, you could get your grades up to the point where you could enter the school. Uh Me going to college was a lot of fun, but it was a waste of their money and my time. I should have gone to a trade school. I was not college material. Uh, I can take a, yeah. a rope and a winch and move the world. I can't do electronics, yeah. Yeah. all the the modern stuff, but I did not need yeah. to be in college. However, I did have a good time for two years. <laughs> okay. Well, I was going to think, uh, uh, Chattahoochee Tech opened up in 1961. I'd have been better off there than I was in yeah. South Georgia in college. Yeah, so I was at Cobb Marietta mm. Votech Vo- School at that time. Mm. Yeah, well, I remember going down for something in Cuthbert, Georgia, years and years ago, and saw this beautiful old house that was for sale, and we went went in and looked at it, asked them, well, how much does this house cost? And they said, 14. I said, 140,000? No, it was (laughs) $14,000. The, uh, one of the school teachers I mentioned a while ago, Mamie Pittner, Uh had gone to school at that same thing, and at that time it was an all-girls school. and she, she and I have talked, sat down and talked about it before she passed away. When they were there, they had to be at least 10 girls. They had to walk single file. Uh-huh. They had to be a teacher in front and a teacher behind okay. for them to go to the square up there. The square was very similar to the Marietta Square. But uh, when I was down there, and this was in 62, 61, the girls had to be in at 8 o'clock on school nights uh-huh. and couldn't leave. The boys had to be in at 8 o'clock. And at 10 o'clock, we could get back out and go and do whatever we felt like we ought to be doing that time of night, but we had to be back in at 10.30. So it was a, it, it wasn't your normal <coughs> school. <coughs> well, that doesn't give you a whole lot of time between 10 and 10.30. It does if you plan well. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, uh, so... <clears throat> uh, when you get through there, what do you do next? I left there and came back and started doing plumbing. Mm-hmm. Uh, with your father? With my father. I thought the world of the man, but I couldn't work for him. So I quit, went to Lockheed. Mm-hmm. Nine years later, he retired, and I took over the plumbing business. Okay. Uh, he was did plumbing, electrical, and heating. I took over just the plumbing end of it, and uh he had had it for 27 years, and I took it over and did it for 35. So, it was one of the older, one of the older three businesses in Ackworth, the one of the flower shops, the funeral home, and then us. Mm-hmm. You know, as long-term businesses in yeah. town. Yeah. So you made a career. Well, um, what what did you do at Lockheed? I was. Worked on a toolbox for a while. I was a crane operator for a while. I was a supervisor for a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, I offered the foreman of everything that you could think of, money and alcohol and buying his lunch and everything else, if they would lay me off <laughs> because I'd already started doing plumbing part-time and I needed to get doing it full-time. And it didn't work until the middle of the winter when they laid me off. And I like to starve to death that first year. Mm. Starting a plumbing company in the middle of the winter is not a real profitable thing. I did a lot of uh, service work around town. I got Mm. paid with pies and cakes and sandwiches and Uh uh, that kind of thing. Lockheed didn't have any use for a plumber? No. Yeah, they did, but... uh, I didn't seem to qualify to get on there. You had to have seniority to get that, and I'd not been there that young. Well, so so you develop your uh, 
that are you come to own your own plumbing company because your father's retired. Yes, I just and, basically took over his plumbing end of it. But tell me the story um, uh, about him being an inspector for the city and you doing plumbing work. That caused a couple of problems. I can honestly say, as far as I know, he never gave me any breaks he didn't give anybody else. It did come up a couple of times, and uh, one of the times that it came up got real nasty, and uh, the man we were meeting with, the mayor, and uh, the man that had done the complaining said something that bottom line about me, and when he did, my father picked him up and shoved him through the wall, and uh, we got that discussion over with in a hurry, and it didn't happen after that. Okay. But it, I can honestly say I don't think he ever cut any corners for me. Mm -hmm. In fact, as he told me one time, he had to make me do more than the rest of them because they'd be checking mine. <laughs> well, that's probably a good philosophy <laughs> to have, although it may not have been comfortable for you. <laughs> um, well, uh, there's some stories that I wanted you to, to tell. Um, and one, uh, you worked a pony rink at the beach, but there's also a story about a pony in the jail. Can, uh, are those two related? Not related at all. Okay. I'll, I'll do the simple one first. Okay. Uh, there again, my father trying to make money. Whenever they opened the beach up, they had a little train ride down there that you could ride on. They had all kind of concessions. Where one of the parking lots is now, he leased the property. We had six or seven Shetland ponies. My job every morning during summer was to saddle all of them up down on Park Street where we kept them mm -hmm. and get them to the beach. Uh, all my friends loved to come help me do that because that means they got to ride the pony from Park Street down to the beach. Mm -hmm. There was a, a round circle, one time around 15 cents, two for a quarter. Mm -hmm. If uh, your kid's too small to hold on, my son will walk beside him and hold him on. I must have walked 500,000 miles down there around and around that circle holding little crying kids on ponies. Uh, but it, it turned, you know, it was a money maker. Mm -hmm. The one about the pony in the jail, that's a whole different setup. Okay. Uh, and it was a pony, it was not a jackass. Uh, the policeman's name was Jack Fowler that found it in there. And there was a lot more that went on that night than just the pony in jail. I mean, there was a lot more that went on. They got the GBI involved. They got Cobb County detectives involved. To they find got, out how the pony got in the jail? No, sir. That pony was a very minor thing that night. Okay. They, uh, just some highlights of it. The funeral home at that time ran the ambulance service. Uh, they got a call that Levi Day, the owner of Day Chevrolet, had been beat up. He was in the back cell of the jail bleeding. So they sent an ambulance down there to pick him up, which needless to say, he wasn't down there. Uh, the city manager at that time, somebody sent the fire department to his house saying that it was on fire. It wasn't. Uh, he thought he had heard a prowler, so he calls the police. Jack Fowler goes over there gives the man the shotgun out of the police car and tells him to go through the woods this way, and he'd circle around to the other side. Well, Jack decided that would be a good time to come uptown and talk to some friends of his, left the man in the woods with the shotgun. That man, and, and, and all my information on this, I happen to have the original minutes from the council meeting the week after the p pony was in jail with all the verification mm -hmm. of who uh, they got a, Cobb County got a call that two people were laying dead, shot in Mary McCall's front yard, but they didn't want anybody to know about it, so please not to call the police. So uh, there well, was who's, big. Who's making these calls? Th most folks had an idea who that was, but nobody knows for sure now. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure they some of them knew, but it was never talked about. It was it was an adult. Friend, friend of some of the people in Ackworth, but okay. there was four by eight plywood signs put on the south end of town saying that yeah. they're entering Ackworth, which is a military zone, and mm -hmm. uh, Mayor McCall is the uh, general, and I mean, just, 
there was a lot of that kind of stuff went on that night. Mm -hmm. And back then they didn't have caller ID. Mm -hmm. So uh didn't know who made the call. Yeah, it, it made the national news, but it was there was a lot more about it than just the pony in now, jail. Did you have any part in all of this? No, sir. Okay. And I can honestly say that it was not one of my father's ponies. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, tell me about uh, your father selling moonshine liquor next to the jail. Uh, yeah, he. Uh, that was another way to make money. He uh, sold liquor, and this he is, sold it out of the— pre-72 when Cobb was yes. trying. And uh, he sold it out of the basement of the Masonic Lodge, and uh, J.F. Uh, Collins Furniture used part of the building. He had the basement leased. We would drive an old panel truck in from Cummins, Georgia. All the moonshine had been put in heat pipe, slid up in it so it didn't roll around. We'd back the truck up. So the liquor actually comes from Cummins? Yes. Uh, we'd back the truck up next to the door, We'd walk around. We lived on Main Street at that time. We would come back the next day, and the truck would be unloaded. It took me a long time to realize who was unloading the truck. There was very little going on in Ackworth at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning back then, and it seemed like two of the Ackworth policemen were the ones unloading the truck into the basement, and they did that for a half gallon of the white liquor. Okay. Uh, yeah. And then your father sold it out of the basement? Or? Out of the basement. I had a boy ask me about that about six months ago. He said, did you know my grandfather? And I said, no. He said, well, apparently him and your daddy were big friends. I said, did you ever say anything about selling liquor out of the basement next to the jail? He said, so what my grandfather told me was, so he really did that. And I said, yeah, he really did. And it went on for a long time. Well, obviously, the police department uh, was supporting. They were very friendly back then. If it wasn't a big deal, they didn't get upset about okay. it. You know, if you'd have robbed a story, it'd have been a whole different thing. Now, what was the story about marijuana coming from the police uh, for a cancer patient? This family that I had known, uh, and to give you an idea how long I've known them, and one of the daughters loves to tell this, we went to their house to work on a well pump. I went with my father, and after we left, the wife says, uh, I didn't know that McCray boy was retarded. And the husband said, what do you mean? She said, he acts like a six-year-old. He says, hell, he is six years old. He just looks 12. <laughs> <laughs> you were always bigger than... Yes, okay. uh, that's how the nickname came about. Mm -hmm. But anyway... I'd ridden to work with this man at Lockheed. I'd known the daughters. I get a phone call one day saying, uh, Moose says, you know, he's got cancer. I said, yes, ma'am, I've heard that. And this will tell you how long ago it was. She says, now, the doctor said if we got some of that Mary Joanna, that uh, it would keep him from being sick. We don't know anybody else to ask. I said, let me check and see if I can find out. So I go to the Ackworth Police Station tell one of the policemen, I said, I need to find out who a drug dealer is in Ackworth. He said, do what? <laughs> I said, I need to buy some marijuana, and I explained all of it to him. He said, wait a minute. He goes back in the jail, comes back out with a baggie with a little bit of marijuana in the bottom of it. I carry it to the lady, give it to him. She calls me a couple of days later and says, Moose, it really has helped a lot, but says it's so harsh it just tears his throat up. I said, well, let me check. So I checked with some of my buddies that I knew smoked, and they said, you need a water pipe. At that time, I had to drive all the way to Atlanta to get a water pipe because you couldn't buy that kind of thing in Cobb County. Mm -hmm. Got it, came back, showed them how to put uh, Mogan David wine in it, smoked the marijuana through it, and it would cool it and flavor it. I get a call, Moose, that really is great, but we're out. Can you get us some more? <coughs> Okay. So I go back to the same policeman. That time he brings out a gallon bag in. I mean, there's a bunch of it in it. I carry it over there, gave it to the lady. Sometimes later the man dies. We go up here to Collins and I walk in and she's sitting down, a little short, heavy set lady, and I sit down beside her on one of the love seats, put my arm around her, tell her how sorry I am. She asked me, she says, uh, have you looked in the coffin? I said, no, ma'am, I don't look in coffins if I don't have to. Come with me. So we step up to the coffin, and all the 
visitors form a little half circle around the lady and her friend. She's a little bit hard of hearing. While we're standing there with all these 50 people in the room, she says, quote, Moose, you know that marijuana you brought over to the house? You need to come get it. I said, let's don't talk about that right now. No, and that pipe thing you smoke it with, you need to get that. And I said, let's don't talk about that right now. Oh, and I want you to get it and give it to somebody else. It really helped. I said, you're going to get me put in jail. Will you please shut up? <laughs> Everybody's just dying laughing. Next morning, my father called me. He's just cracking up. He said, I understand you're a new drug dealer in town. I said, everybody in town's laughing about it. I said, I couldn't get the woman to shut up. She just kept on and kept on. <laughs> well, I hope that wasn't evidence of the case. <laughs> well, it probably was, but that wouldn't be any worse than one of the boys they had locked up in there one day. They had a file cabinet, uh -huh. and they kept a lot of the stuff that was confiscated in uh -huh. the file cabinet, liquor uh -huh. and that kind of thing. Uh -huh. He got two straws, taped them together with a Band-Aid, uh -huh. and could, or they could open the file cabinet up about that far. He pulled it out just enough to get the straw down there and drank liquor out of the evidence while he was locked up in jail. <laughs> so there was a lot of things went on in Ackworth other folks don't know about. <laughs> Well, now, did you shoot out the red light? What's no, the story sir. about that? But it was shot out several times. That was one of the big things back in those days was people would ride through late at night, mm -hmm. shoot the red light. It was kind of a dare thing. I personally never participated in any of that. Okay. But some of the more prominent folks in Ackworth did. Really? Uh, tell me about Mary McCall. Oh, that, that part of it was... Uh, she was the mayor. She, she was the mayor in 64, I think it was. Ackworth got a police station that they put right across the street from a caddy corner to cross from Henry's restaurant. Mm -hmm. It was about a eight by eight building that had the radios in it. That's where the police worked out of. The jail was back behind town. And as they were moving the building in, and, and Mary McCall was probably one of the better mayors we've ever had, mm -hmm. but she was very... She didn't pull any punches, we'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. She rides by and they're trying to get that building situated and leveled up and that kind of thing. She sticks her head out just as far as she could and she screams, hey, is that a two-holer or a three-holer y'all are putting out there? Because mm -hmm. it looked like an outhouse sitting out in the middle of the yeah. parking lot type thing. Well, so. Um, you have a Dr. Cobble story about somebody that, getting a bill? That was, was one of mine. I had an uncle that was a hypochondriac. Uh -huh. He was a barber, and every day when Dr. Cobble would walk from his office to the other end of town to get mm -hmm. the mail out, don't matter who the uncle's hair was cutting, uh -huh. he'd say, I'll be back in a minute. He'd head out of the barber shop, get mm -hmm. across there, and he'd stop, stop Dr. Cobble and say, you know, I've got my headache or I've got this or whatever. And what do you think I ought to do about it? Well, it happened so often that Dr. Cobble, which had a sense of humor also, sent him a bill for a sidewalk visit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, folks, back in those days, either I was lucky enough to know all or know a lot of them, mm -hmm. but everybody seemed to have a sense of humor and, mm -hmm. and th folks didn't get mad about stuff like they do now. Um, you said something about the Day Sisters. Is this Day Chevrolet? No, this was two sisters that uh, I worked for. They lived right across the railroad over here. The two, old, I think they were old maid sisters. Uh, they would call me. They both lived on Social Security. They could not afford sink faucets and a plumber to put them in and all. Mm -hmm. I'd go by every couple of three months, put a nickel faucet washer in the faucet and all. And I happened to be there the day that Jimmy Carter was running for president the second time, and it was raining like crazy. And I'm sitting there working on the sink, and the phone rings. And one of the sisters answered it, and I'm hearing one side of the conversation. And she said, no, no, I'm not going over there and stand in the rain to vote for him. He wouldn't stand in the rain to vote for me. <laughs> no, if I vote, I'm going to vote for him. Don't tell me that you're not better off now than you were four years ago. We're all better off than we were four years ago. And she listened for a minute. 
She said, good old days, hell, do you not remember going out behind the barn and dumping the slop jar every morning? As far as I'm concerned, that wasn't good old days. Mm -hmm. And anyway, I'm sitting there hearing this one side. I get ready to leave and put all my tools up. I start out the door. She says, come here a minute. I walk over there and she walks to the bedroom, opens the door, says, come in here a minute. I walk in and she shuts the door behind us. She walks over to the chest of drawers, fumbles through it for a minute. She brings out a blue velvet bag that says Crown Royal on it. She hands it to me and says, here, take a drink of this. And don't you tell sister I've got it in here either. <laughs> so, you know, we all had fun back in those days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we went so quickly over the, the story of the beach and uh, the lake that uh, it didn't say anything about the teen canteen. Where was that? That is a building right down here off of uh, Dallas Street. It, is that Dallas it runs? To, down to the lake. Yeah, down to the lake. Whatever the name You're of it is. The one right beside Hen well, the one right beside Henry's down here in front of Nancy Baxter, in front of City Hall. Yeah. Uh, Going on down. Yeah. Right, right before you get to the curve. Okay. Anyway, uh, the mayor ended up buying that, remodeling it, and making a, a house out of it. But yeah. it, it was the a ladies' uh, book club for a while, and oh, okay. then they used it for the uh, teen canteen, mm -hmm. and it was it was a place for kids to go, and you know it was fairly well chaperoned. They, it didn't mm -hmm. take a lot because we didn't do a whole lot. Yeah. Did you ran your truck in the lake once. You used to up on the upper end of town where they blew the bridge out. Uh, the road sloped down and everybody, it wasn't just me, would go up there and pull their truck out and about their car in about a foot, 18 inches of water, carry a bucket, you could wash it, dip water out of the lake, throw on it and that kind of thing. Mine one day wouldn't crank and I kept letting it roll a little further and a little further thinking it'd crank till the water finally got up over the seats. That's when I had to call somebody to come get me. Uh, ended up my mother's one that come got me. She never let me forget that. Uh, okay. And your wife fell in the lake once? Well, that wasn't exactly the way that happened either, but uh, that just shows you the kind of friends that I have. And somebody pushed her in? And, oh, well, no. She was standing in the boat uh, with an armload of towels. Uh -huh. That was back when the beehive hairdos were the, the big thing. Uh -huh. I started to get in the boat, and when I did, it went like so and threw her out. Mm. She came up out of the water, and that beehive hairdo was down around her chin, mm. and she was not happy. And this buddy of mine walks over there, opens his billfold up, and hands me a $5 bill right in front of her and says, I didn't think you'd do it. Oh. Uh, <laughs> her attitude got progressively worse I after bet. that. I but, okay. Um, okay. Um, just had a few other questions I wanted to ask you, but uh, yeah, uh, with the new depot museum about to open up next month, uh, uh, the depot scales, you, uh, how did you come to acquire them? Me and a couple of boys were sitting up there one night between the depot and the old cotton wire house, mm -hmm. which is where the boys gathered at night. We'd go up there and sit and possibly drank a beer and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And we were sitting there one night and I just turned around and looked and those scales had jumped in the back of my pickup truck and, and that's all I'm me. saying. Okay. Okay. <laughs> all by themselves. All by themselves. They just ran out there and jumped in the back of my truck. Yeah. So they were your scales after that? I carried them and stored them in my, one of my father's barns and uh 45, 50 years later, when the city started doing a, a new depot up here, mm -hmm. I figured that was a good place for them to be. Okay. Well, that's a good story. Mm -hmm. And I understand you donated some lots for where Logan Park is today? The, this, one of the city councilmen came to me. I, I'd bought 13 lots at 1 o'clock in the morning because the man that owned them was going to be served with divorce papers the next day, and he wanted them out of his name. I'd, uh, they were all floodplain lots. They were of no real value, but they looked good on a uh, sheet that you show the bank of having a lot of 
mm-hmm. building lots. Mm-hmm. That was in an area that was low income, and the city qualified to build a park Mm -hmm. in a low income area. So I donated, well, actually, I sold the city one lot, and I donated them five more, and they built a little park on it. Then later, whenever they started building Logan Park, they attached it to that park. Mm -hmm. So it it was there before Logan Park, but it later became a part of it. Right. And you could drive uh, in Ackworth at age 14 back then? A lot of us did. That was more the police thing. If you didn't make a problem, they wasn't a problem. Okay. Uh, it was not unusual for me to load a little aluminum boat up and a motor okay. carry it to the lake and uh, yeah. do that kind of thing. One of the times I had this little flat bottom boat mm-hmm. and a seven and a half horsepower wizard motor made by Western Auto. Yeah. And I found out with just me in it as I went across the lake, the front end was about five foot off the water and running at a 45 type thing. But if I could work my way to the front of the boat, I could drive it like a motorcycle. I could lean one way or the other and the boat would turn as it was. Mm-hmm. So I was on the lake uh, cruising pretty, pretty. I thought pretty good. I may not have been going that fast, but there was a lot of fishermen all that was unhappy with me setting a wake up and boat people and that kind of thing. And I get through and load it up, put it on the truck, carry it back home, unload the boat, unload the motor, walk up on the porch. And as soon as I walk up on the porch, my father grabbed me by the arm and he had a clear plastic belt about that wide. And he proceeded to apply it to me. It seems like he had set over at what we call the little dam. Mm-hmm in the pickup truck and watched me out on the water doing my thing Uh with no life jacket, no nothing else. And Mm -hmm. uh, he explained to me that that wasn't what I needed to be doing. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, how has Ackworth changed over the last 75 years? The fact that it's gotten so much bigger, uh, a good example of that, I went to a smoke on the lake a couple of weeks ago. Uh-huh. I was down there about four hours and it was totally covered with people. Mm-hmm. I never saw a person I knew the whole time I was there. Right. Used to, I could walk up and down Main Street and speak to everybody there because I knew most of them by name. Uh-huh. So that part of it, I, I hope the young people can form lifetime friends like we did back then. Mm-hmm. But uh you know, I, I can't say anything about I'm opposed to it. I'd be a little hypocritical about it. I made my living plumbing new houses with people moving into mm-hmm. Ackworth. But now that I'm not plumbing it, I'd be happy if it didn't continue to grow. I'd like to, it's got out of mm. out of my hand as far as mm-hmm. knowing people and seeing things. Mm-hmm. It's just not the small town I grew up in. Yeah. But I love the stuff that's here. I, you know, I can't complain about it. It's just not like yeah. it was. Yeah. Well, maybe that's a good way to end the interview, unless there's anything. Well, I, I believe that covers me. If there's anything on there you can use, have at it. All right. <laughs> well, thank you very much. You're welcome.